This week on The Handle. Learn how the too short life of an Amarillo musician may inspire the city for decades to come. Plus, visit a new art hotspot in Plainview. Meet a Jersey girl turned cowgirl and move to the flow of a creative troupe. All of this right now on Panhandle PBS as we tell the stories of the Texas Panhandle. He was somebody who was so alive, he just represented life. And all of a sudden, somebody said, he's not here, he's gone. After all this happened, uh, I started talking to friends of AJ. Uh, at first, it was just to sort of talk, you know. And then somewhere in that year, I think 2013, I sat down with Craig Vaughn. That's my first memory of it. It was weird because we went down to a place that used to be called the Burger Bar. I forget what it's called now, but it's on Pope. We met down there, and uh, Craig sat down at a table. I always tell the story. And there was a bunch of stuff in the middle of the table, like ketchup and stuff. So he moved out of the way. And we looked and it said AJ right there. It was carved, somebody had carved AJ in the middle of that table and we looked at each other and it was such a weird thing, you know. Like, and we kind of joke with the with the committee about how he's he's watching, he's overseeing, you know, and he's he's messing with us at the same time, you know. The, the project is a plaza, an outdoor plaza in downtown Amarillo uh, that would accomplish multiple objectives. Uh, certainly its primary objective is to honor the memory of AJ Swope and that's the amphitheater that will have a really nice stage with nice lighting and sound, and that'll seat about 300 people. Past that, we have the First Responders Memorial, which will honor all of the men and women who have lost their lives protecting us um, in the top 26 counties of the Texas Panhandle. And the third section of that is the Texas Panhandle Walk of Fame, and that's going to be several walls that surround the uh, amphitheater, the stage that... Um, honor people from all over our region who have gone on to do really, really cool and great things. Uh, we need to recognize in a central spot uh, folks from all walks of life who have contributed to our well-being over the last 130 years. But we've got all these, you know, everything from Olympic athletes to, you know, musicians and actors and just, you know, uh, political people that we could put on there. And uh, that's a pretty long list that he has put together. And uh, it's, it's out there uh, uh, in cyberspace, but we want a tangible spot to honor these people. Uh, from an overall standpoint, certainly the memorial is there to recognize uh, the contributions that A.J. made uh, during his lifetime. A.J. was driving to Dumas on a Tuesday morning to go talk to a group of retired teachers about wind energy and a woman committing suicide crossed the um, center lane, crossed the divided highway rather, and um, drove into oncoming traffic for several miles. She narrowly missed a couple of people and she, um, she hit AJ. AJ in his spirit was an all-inclusive person. In his day job and how he brought people together and this plaza just really embodies that. AJ touched so many lives, not just in Amarillo, but across the entire Panhandle and I don't think any of us realized how big his impact was until he wasn't here with us. AJ was multifaceted. He was a former newsman. He was a wind energy executive and at night he was a musician. And so as far as wind energy, he worked to bring our entire region together so we understood the importance of it and helped just move that whole movement along. As far as music, he actually started something where musicians in Amarillo started working together with each other to help promote and move forward as opposed to working against each other. He was mostly self-taught. Self um, the, the writing was all he does. It was just, and his voice was just amazing. He wasn't trying to impress anybody. He wasn't trying to, you know, make you, make you love him. He just loved him, you know, he just loved the music. I've never experienced that kind of loss before because it's almost like the world stopped turning, you know, that day. People in this community have wanted to do something for AJ since the day we lost him. We didn't want to create a whole other organization because we're, we're going to build this and we're going to give it away at the end of the day. Uh, so the Area Foundation set up a fund, the AJ Swope Fund. Uh, the project itself has a price tag of about two and a half million dollars. 
we are in the process of raising that uh, two and a half million dollars uh, as we speak today. And uh, we, uh, we hope to have that, those resources raised as soon as possible. The property uh, on which this uh, memorial will reside is City of Amarillo property. Uh, we have had the privilege of visiting with the council and senior leadership at City Hall. They have committed that piece of ground just south of the ballpark uh, for this purpose. So in the sense of a public-private partnership, that's the first piece of the public-private partnership arrangement. We also believe that that green space will also be very important in opening up the area to the east and to the south of the MPEV, the old warehouse district, to uh, long-term development, particularly the idea of residential development in downtown. This is going to be something that, you know, our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids and for generations to come can walk over here and, and, you know, hear somebody playing an acoustic guitar in the background while they're looking at names and getting on their phones to find out information about these great people. Here's A.J. Swope in The Last Train Home. I call them A.J.'s champions, A.J.'s four champions. They loved and loved AJ more than you know really more than comprehension the um, the time and effort and energy that these people have invested from their lives to do this for him is it's just almost just unbelievable that that he was just so loved. I'm not sure he would think his name needs to be on it, like most people, you know, just the humble part of him. But to see so many people come together to honor so many other people, once again, it goes right in line with what he was trying to do with music and wind energy. Um, just, he loved the Panhandle, he loved downtown, and everything about this project just screams AJ, and I think he would just be ecstatic. He would be overwhelmed. He would be very overwhelmed, but if he could have played there, that's what he would have loved. Well, I was an uh, artist in Houston and I was starting to dabble in creative placemaking. Creative placemaking is when you bring art into a community and your community involvement uh, helps make just a space a place. I'm Kelly Allison and I'm the director of the Contemporary Arts Museum Plainview. Rural communities are really the new frontier for the arts. Uh, artists are starting to move into small towns. The rent is good. Uh, people can create. They can have the freedom without the hustle and bustle of the big city. My parents reached an age that they were either going to have to move out of their home or somebody was going to have to come here and take care of them. I grew up in Plainview, Texas, and so it just seemed like the natural thing to do. I built a board of directors by just going on Facebook and trying to find people within the community that looked interesting and had also some experience maybe with the local community, the local government, some of those things that we could tap into. Uh, my best uh, help and um, assistant, Robin Barrett, has been here almost every day since we opened the doors. So I am an artist, I'm an oil painter, generally a surrealist, so contemporary art is my scene. The Contemporary Arts Museum is living. Uh, it's not a housing full of things that we've already set on a pedestal and we've already made an icon out of them. This is a living thing. Contemporary art to me is probably the most inclusive genre of art. The thing that really does draw me to contemporary art the most is its ability to be transitory. I like change. I think change is good. <laughs> If this space continues along the path it's on, it's already exceeded my hopes. Each second Saturday, we do something for the community. We have a, a chili cook-off, or we have a dance, or we bring in a band, but that's brought in people from the community that wouldn't normally uh, be interested in art. We were able to um, 
bring in a local artist. Rigo Ray did our mural and he teaches at Coronado High School. We worked with the juvenile justice education program here in Hale County and painted skateboards with the kids. And so we've been pretty active within the community. Um, almost everything we've done here though was we really owe to the Sybil B. Harrington Foundation and the Community Foundation for West Texas because they supported us the very first year. Without them, I don't really think we would probably have gotten off the ground. Like other culinary artists from West Texas Chef's Table, Chef Rory Shapizi served a meal as part of the Panhandle PBS Savor the Goods dinner series. Initially, Shapizi was just visiting the Texas Panhandle, but she stayed and set down roots among the ranchers and farmers she grew to appreciate. Shapizi focused her Savor the Goods menu on certified Angus beef from Olson Land and Cattle near Hereford. She traveled with us to the ranch to talk beef and tap dancing with Steve and Ginger Olson. When I first moved out here, I didn't even know who George Strait was. Literally, I didn't never even tasted brisket, okay? And for being a chef, it's pretty crazy. On top of it, I was a vegetarian. For eight years, I was a vegetarian. Hi, I'm Rory Shapizi, and I live right outside Amarillo, Texas, in a town called Bushland. I am the owner-operator of The Drunken Oyster, located in Amarillo. For nine years, I owned a restaurant called Boot Hill Saloon and Grill, which was a steakhouse that featured certified Angus beef. And now we are here in Hereford, Texas, to show you guys exactly where that beef comes from. Originally, I am from Bergen County, New Jersey, and it's a crazy story. I ended up on a reality show approximately 15 years ago and that reality show was filmed in a town called Vega, Texas. My family, they're all from New York and New Jersey, and they literally were like, you are not gonna make it in Texas. I thought I'd be here for about a week. 15 years later, two restaurants later, here I am. I got to experience things when I came out here that somebody from New Jersey or LA would have never seen. The Western lifestyle, the agricultural lifestyle, uh, farming and ranching was just something that I saw in movies. And I was very drawn to it. Not to mention I was drawn to the cowboys too. You know, they're kind of cute. <laughs> and so uh, that probably helped a little bit in maybe meeting one of them. But, you know, I grew up in an area that I would go to the grocery store and I never thought, where does this produce come from? Where do these steaks come from? I just would go and just, they're there. I would go and grab them and never think about what it took to put these items on our table to create these amazing dishes. And so when I came out to Vega, I had the opportunity to work at feed yards, to work at ranches, to have my own cow-calf operation and really learn how hard it is and how much work goes into being able to put one steak on the table. At that point, I really started to befriend people in the cattle industry and the ranchers and just see how these families come together to produce this amazing product that we all get to sit down and enjoy. I am a graduate from the Culinary Institute of America in New York, and then I went to Johnson & Wales for hotel restaurant management. Uh, during the time that I was at CIA, I was a vegetarian the entire time, which Oh my goodness, these classic chefs, they're old German chefs, European chefs. When I was in Meat ID and Meat Fabrication, I was like, ew, meat, you know, I wouldn't eat it. So this one time, one of my chefs made me go into the meat locker, this is in Meat Fabrication class, and hug a side of beef for the entire six hour class. So at that point, although I was a vegetarian, I was like, I got this. So then I ended up slowly even when I was constructing my recipes, I would taste it and I would actually spit it out because that, I was still a vegetarian. <laughs> so one night um, I had a friend of mine said, I'll make you a deal, I'll eat fish if you eat steak. And I hadn't eaten steak in eight, it was almost eight years at this point, six, six or eight years. And uh, I said, I can't, the doctor said that I wouldn't be able to digest it. And finally I was like, you know what, I'm gonna try it. So I had a piece of filet mignon and I was so upset because I wasted years of missing out on such a great, amazing, flavorful thing. And I was like, why did I waste all this time? And so the next morning I woke up and made myself steak and eggs. 
that's all she wrote. Being a vegetarian definitely made me take more notice in produce and the freshness of produce. But once again, during those times I grew up, I was in New Jersey and New York. And so you didn't get to see the farms. You didn't get to see these people putting the passion every day. You know, yeah, there were greenhouses in New Jersey, but it wasn't something that until you're submersed into the culture, do you have appreciation for it? So for so many people who are on the East or West Coast or in metropolitan areas that don't think about it, I wish everybody would have the opportunity to immerse themselves into the culture of the farming and ranching communities because you would just have so much more appreciation of your food. I did a little show that I'm sure some of you have heard of called Food Network Star, and that was definitely one of the craziest, craziest, did I mention crazy experiences of my life? Um, during the season I was on, there was initially 10 of us in a two room apartment in the village in New York City. Uh, they had fluorescent lights on us 24 seven and it was nuts. Um, I got to meet some of the most amazing chefs that I'm still friends with to this day. It was something that I would never take back. I really wish that I had the opportunity to do it again now because I just know so much more than I did when I did the show. It's funny, people ask me all the time, what's your favorite ingredient or what's your favorite dish to cook? And the one thing I will say is just having the relationship with Certified Angus Beef and having my steakhouse, I can cook a steak. I mean, Bobby Flay and I have gone head to head. So, you know, if someone comes into my restaurant and asks for A1, it's not happening. It's funny because beef is a product that I love to work with, but I have a fresh seafood restaurant. But that also falls into it, you know, knowing the difference between fresh and, and frozen seafood. It all plays together from produce to, to uh, meat to fish. It's where is this product coming from? You know, is it just being mass produced? Or are there actually, you know, farmers and ranchers working every day to make this happen? Just like, you know, um, you know, my fishmongers who are out fishing, sending us messages at three o'clock in the morning. This is what the boat's bringing in. What would you like? What is the taste of success to you? Wow, that's a good one. Winning the lottery. <laughs> uh, the taste of success could fall into so many different things, but for me, yes, everyone can say financial. For me personally is when I put out really good product and I see smiling faces eating what we just created. Could you do anything else? I am so multi-talented. <laughs> I could do so many things, but tap dancing is the one that I'm best at. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I can tap though. <laughs> so uh, I was raised showing Angus heifers and uh, went off to Texas A&M to study animal science. And at the time that I had an older brother, a year older in, in a and &M, and uh, my dad wasn't just real excited about who I was dating. In fact, he was a preacher. Can you imagine? He, he told my brother to find someone else and this is who he found, it was Steve. First of all, I want you to, to say both your names, uh, where we are and what you do. And then I want to ask you uh, how you got, how you won her over. <laughs> oh. I'm Steve Olson, this is my wife, Ginger. We are located about 12 miles southeast of Hereford. We ranch for a living. We got acquainted at Texas A&M University. Her brother actually lived above me in dormitory and introduced us, and she was a blind date. And we hit it off, and here we are. We did okay, we dated, and uh just loved being at A&M. He came home to farm when he graduated. He was two years older and, and I got through A&M and we moved up here and life has been good ever since. Steve grew up raising shorthorns and so when we dated at A&M, I was Miss Texas Angus at the time and he would take me to different functions and it would be the shorthorn reader from Hereford, Texas was escorting Miss Texas Angus. So we had a lot of fun with that going through college. And, uh, as you see now, the cattle are black, 
My dowry came with one black horse and three black cows, and I always kidded him. My cows were better than his, and... Um, the horse was terrible. <laughs> we raise Angus cattle because they are the premier breed, and the demand for them is higher than any, any other breed. And certainly, uh, when we started in 1980, CAB was just beginning, and just beginning to get a foothold, uh, the Certified Angus Beef Program. And uh, since that time, it, it has grown along with our Angus breed because of the demand. We have a little over 250 mother cows that we keep on the ranch year round. And then uh, they calve every year, so we have calves to go with that. We are actually environmentally friendly, have been for all of our lives. Uh, the, the word sustainability has come to be a buzzword in our industry and to me that that means three things basically. We have to take care of our land and natural resources, we have to take care of our cattle, and we have to take care of the people that are helping us and that requires a profit and that's where CAB comes into a premium product at a better price for us and allows us to do that. What is it about a baby cow? Oh wow, one of the joys of being a rancher is watching that little group of babies that are two weeks old and they're out there playing with one another, button heads, kicking up their heels and just having the best time and that's just a real joy. My role at the ranch mm -hmm. is family. Um, our lifestyle revolves around family. We chose to stay on the, the ranch and raise our children. Um, and as a result, they have a love, they grew a love for the ranch. They each went off and majored in agriculture, married agriculture uh, spouses, and we're so fortunate that they live within 30 miles of us and all engaged in agriculture. We have the opportunity to work together all the time. Steve and I spend seven days a week together. Uh, he doesn't go off to an office. I'm with him a lot of the time. Uh, he does like to escape every once in a while and play golf. I don't do that. <laughs> and when he does that, I do grandkids. Satisfaction of um, producing something that is that others enjoy uh, that's that's totally behind it all, uh, and then get to live live out here in the country, uh, and take care of what God has given us, is uh, really uh, uh, a joy to us, and really uh, makes you feel good. Could you do anything else? Oh sure, but we love what we do. So why would we want to try? I sure can't tap dance. <laughs> <laughs>
um, look up tutorial videos. That's something we're working on with the page. You know, kind of gonna put all the types of different flow arts individually on there so people can kind of explore around and maybe pick something that they like. People are really excited to be able to come out and enjoy themselves, you know, have their kids out. That's another big thing about it. It's, it's kid friendly. I'm trying to get people to become aware and like have uh, something they can do like where they can get out, get outside in the nice weather, you know, do something other than watch Netflix or, you know, be on their phone. So that's pretty much like the point, trying to build like a strong community, like everyone coming out and sharing their art together. May her peace be an anchor in stormy times. May your hope run like a river that'll never run dry. May your burdens grow light. May your worries subside. This is my prayer for you. May your soul grow deep. May your joy run wild. May your heart know the face of mercy has smiled. May your faith come to let you believe like a child. This is my prayer for you. This is my prayer for you. If you want to see a scary movie, come on, look inside my